record button. <clears throat> All right, can everybody see the PowerPoint? Yes. Very good. All right, so we left off <clears throat> getting through um, the pituitary gland, the anterior and posterior pituitary gland, and just getting into the thyroid gland with respect to where it's located in the cervical region around your, your voice box, your larynx. Uh, we talked a little bit about how the thyroid hormones were produced and the steps that are involved in the production of at least T3 and T4. So make sure you just know these few steps. And also <clears throat> the majority of these steps are initiated by a hormone from the anterior pituitary gland. It's called thyroid stimulating hormone that we covered. So thyroid stimulating hormone is produced by a cell type in the anterior pituitary gland called the thyrotrophs. The thyrotrophs can only produce their hormone, which is thyroid stimulating hormone, if the hypothalamus releases a hormone called thyrotropin releasing hormone. So the hypothalamus has to release thyrotropin releasing hormone, abbreviation TRH, which causes the thyrotrophs in the anterior pituitary gland to release TSH, which is thyroid stimulating hormone. And thyroid stimulating hormones target is this cell right here. This is the thyroid follicular cell, which is the little cuboidal cell right here that lines the follicle. <clears throat> so these follicular cells right here are the cells that make T3 and T4. And the only way that <clears throat> these cells can make T3 and T4 is if they receive thyroid stimulating hormone first. So once thyroid stimulating hormone is binding to receptors in the membrane, which is a, it's a protein hormone, so it's water soluble, it'll bind to a receptor in the membrane and start to trigger these events to occur inside the thyroid follicular cell. And we began to produce T3 and T4. So this is where we ended up last time. I did not go over <clears throat> the functions of T3 and T4, which I have listed some of their major functions here. But some of the major functions of uh, thyroid hormones, T3 and T4, has to do with energy usage in the body. That's one of its principal effects in our body. It increases the efficiency of our cells and tissues to be able to produce ATP energy aerobically. So we're not going back over aerobic respiration but I'll just tell you this, if someone has hypothyroidism, you might've heard of that before. That's if they don't have enough thyroid hormone. One of the, some of the main effects of that is that they don't have any energy. They have, they're, they're very lethargic and tired. They gain weight because they can't utilize energy sources very well. So that'll give you a little bit to go on later on to help you remember this. And so what we call that is basal, basal metabolic rate. So thyroid hormone helps increase our basal metabolic rate. I'm not gonna ask you the definition of BMR on the test, but I, you should know a little bit about it. So I'm just gonna tell you, <clears throat> the basal metabolic rate is the rate at which our cells in our body consume oxygen to make ATP aerobically after a 24 hour fast. So after you haven't eaten anything for 24 hours, what is the fastest rate that we can make ATP? That would be called the basal metabolic rate. So <clears throat> thyroid hormones help increase this so we can burn off the fuel sources that we consume like sugar, fats, and proteins. So that's one thing that it does. It also helps maintain our, our body temperature because it increases metabolic activity in the cell and these chemical reactions and the way some of these uh, transporters work, uh, specifically one that you learned about the sodium potassium pump, 
these things give off heat as a byproduct of them working. So it helps maintain our body temperature. So for that reason, hypothyroidic individuals sometimes have a lower body temperature than normal, right? Uh, and if you have hyperthyroidism, for that, for that matter, some of those individuals have a higher body temperature than normal. So it helps maintain our body temperature. Thyroid hormone helps our tissues produce protein. So it helps maintain tissue growth, repair, and reproduction by increasing the efficiency of protein production in our cells. Um, thyroid hormone helps us burn our sugar and our fats to make ATP. I don't know what, I guess I went out of turn when I said that. Um, and it is a permissive hormone. Now, I think we talked about that uh, briefly in lab. I don't know if I mentioned it in here, but thyroid hormone is a permissive acting hormone with epinephrine and norepinephrine on the heart. And basically what that means is that thyroid hormones helps the cardiac muscle cells upregulate their beta receptors. So if they increase the number of receptors in the membrane, they become more responsive to epinephrine and norepinephrine, which are the catecholamines. If you want to write that out beside here, that would be good. I guess I should have done that. I'll do it now. We'll see. That's, those are the catecholamines, epinephrine and norepinephrine. And then uh, thyroid hormone uh, works with uh, human growth hormone and insulin, all to help our body grow, tissues to reproduce and repair. Mainly, this function is associated with number three, protein synthesis, because human growth hormone and insulin are also protein building hormones. Same thing with thyroid hormone. So these are some of the main effects of thyroid hormone. They have a, a few others, but this is what, what I want you to know for the exam. All right, so here's a negative feedback loop that I was just mentioning. The steps involved in getting the thyroid gland to make T3 and T4. And it always goes in this direction. The hypothalamus has to produce a hormone that affects the anterior pituitary gland that then will affect the target gland. So in this case, if the thyroid hormones T3 and T4 are low in the body, the hypothalamus is sensitive to that. So the hypothalamus says, yep, we don't have enough T3 and T4. So we better release thyrotropin releasing hormone, TRH, which circulates down to the anterior pituitary gland, binds to receptors on thyrotrophs, and causes the thyrotrophs to produce thyroid stimulating hormone, which gets into the blood, circulates down to its target, which is the thyroid follicular cells and the thyroid gland, and they begin to produce T3 and T4. So this negative loop runs and runs and runs until there's enough T3 and T4 in the blood, in which case there's a negative inhibitory feedback. The hypothalamus says we have enough T3 and T4, so let's stop releasing TRH. In the absence of TRH, you don't get TSH out. In the absence of TSH, the thyroid follicular cells stop making T3 and T4. So it's a negative feedback loop. So make sure you know that. So I'll put here uh, the table from our book that has the principal control of secretion and the principal actions of the hormones. So make sure you review those. Oh, and calcitonin, I think I'm gonna mention again, and I'm gonna mention in a minute as we do the parathyroid gland. Calcitonin is another hormone from the thyroid gland, but it's not produced by the follicular cells. It's produced by the parafollicular cells, which lies on the outside of a follicle. So uh, uh, calcitonin is totally different from thyroid hormones. Thyroid hormones are involved in everything metabolic, controlling metabolism of everything in our body. Um, the calcitonin's involved with monitoring and then controlling the level of calcium and phosphates in the blood. So its main role, I'll just tell you, it's pretty easy. The main role of calcitonin is to lower blood calcium levels. 
So we're gonna go over that loop in a second, but it's all in one place on this little slide for you. All right, so let's talk about the parathyroid glands. The parathyroid glands lie on the posterior aspect of the thyroid. So here's the, the back of our neck. Here's the back view, posterior view of the thyroid gland, the lobes. And on the posterior aspect of it, there's four little nodules of glandular tissue. Those little four nodules of glandular tissues are called the parathyroid gland. The parathyroid gland looks different histolo histologically from the thyroid. So here's a graphic of a section through the thyroid where the parathyroid would be located. On this side, you see these little circles again. These are the thyroid follicles. Here's the follicular cells on the thyroid produce T3 and T4. These are the parafollicular cells that produce calcitonin. This represents the parathyroid gland. There are two basic types of cells in the parathyroid gland. There's a cell called the chief cell or principal cells, kind of an older name. And then there's something called an oxyphil cell. So the one I'm most interested in are the chief cells. These are the majority of the, of the cells in there that produce parathyroid hormone. The function of the oxyphil cell is still under investigation. Uh, they have some ideas about it. Uh, and they know that under certain circumstances like parathyroid cancers and whatnot, that these oxyphil cells can increase parathyroid production, hormone production. So the principal cells or the chief cells are the ones that we concentrate on that produce PTH. So let's look at what it does. <clears throat> First of all, calcitonin from the thyroid gland, parafollicular cells, and parathyroid hormone are antagonistic hormones. That means that they do opposite things. So whereas calcitonin is going to try and lower our blood calcium levels, parathyroid hormone is going to try and raise our blood calcium levels. So what controls the cells that produce these hormones? Well, it's calcium levels directly in the blood. The cells in these that produce these hormones, the parafollicular cells in the thyroid for calcitonin, and the chief cells in the parathyroid gland for parathyroid hormone are directly sensitive to how much calcium is in the blood. So it works pretty simply. If our blood calcium levels are too high, high levels of calcium in the blood, which is called hypercalcemia. During hypercalcemic events or high calcium, the parafollicular cells in the thyroid gland say, hey, we have too much calcium. We need to release calcitonin. So calcitonin is released from the thyroid gland when there's too much calcium. So what does it do? Well, we don't want to just get rid of our calcium. We want to store it in case we need it later on. So we're going to put the excess calcium from the blood into our storeroom. And the calcium storeroom in our body are the bones in the skeletal system. That's where we have the majority of the calcium in our body, in our skeletal system. So calcitonin basically inhibits the osteoclasts from breaking down bony matrix and thereby blocks the release of calcium. We don't want to release any because we have too much already. And so we stop releasing calcium and it allows the osteoblast in the bone tissue itself to take the calcium up from the blood and deposit it in new bony matrix. So for that reason, calcitonin helps lower our blood calcium levels. You stop releasing calcium from the bone because you block osteoclast, but you allow the osteoblast to take the calcium up from the blood and put it in the bone. So that goes on and on and on until lo and behold, your calcium levels might fall too low. And if the calcium levels fall too low, which is called hypocalcemia, 
it causes the para, um, it causes the principal cells of the parathyroid gland to release parathyroid hormone. Now, parathyroid hormone has several different effects in the body, and it basically brings about one thing. All of those roles bring about one thing. It raises our blood calcium level. So that's the end result. So how does PTH cause for an increase in calcium is the question then. Well, I'll tell you this. If you don't have enough calcium in your blood, you need to go to your storeroom where you have the calcium and take some out. All right? So the storeroom, again, is the bone. If we don't have enough calcium, parathyroid hormone goes to the, the bone and it turns on osteoclasts. Osteoclasts break down the bony matrix and causes what we call bone resorption. So calcium is released from the extracellular matrix of bone and it's released into the blood. So that's one way that we increase it. Parathyroid hormone also targets our kidney. The last thing you really want to do if you don't have enough calcium in your blood is to urinate your calcium out. So parathyroid hormone goes to the kidney. I'm going to tell you exactly where when we get to the, the kidney chapter later. It tells the kidney, hey, we don't have enough calcium. I need you to reabsorb all the calcium you can and not lose any more in, in urine. So basically, parathyroid hormone causes for an increased reabsorption of calcium, so it prevents the loss in urine. Thirdly, parathyroid hormone tells the kidney to activate vitamin D. The most active form of vitamin D is calcitriol. Calcitriol basically is a hormone. It's an active form of vitamin D. It's only produced by the kidney when parathyroid hormone is present. Now, parathyroid hormone and calcitriol are called synergistic hormones. Synergists are hormones that achieve the same common goal. So PTH is going to try and increase blood calcium levels. So is calcitriol. So what does calcitriol do? Well, calcitriol targets your small intestine, the absorptive cells in your small intestine. You learned that in AMP1 as simple, non-ciliated simple columnar epithelium, if you remember that. So those absorptive cells in our small intestines, when they receive calcitriol, which is a steroid hormone, by the way, vitamin D is a steroid hormone, causes the cells in our gut to absorb a maximal amount of calcium from the foods we eat. So if you're consuming foods that have calcium in it and calcitriol is present, you're going to maximize your absorption of calcium from your diet and put that calcium in the blood. However, if calcitriol is not present, you'll absorb a little bit of calcium, but not a whole lot. The rest of it you'll lose when you go to the bathroom. So we need calcitriol to increase calcium absorption from our, from our gastrointestinal tract. So both of these help increase calcium and calcitonin helps decrease it. So calcitonin is an antagonist to both of these hormones and vice versa. All right, so I'll put a little, another slide here talks about the roles of uh, parathyroid hormone. Please review that. Oh, I didn't mention uh, phosphate. HPO4, by the way, which I'm not going to write out on the test. I usually just write out the name phosphate. Um, parathyroid hormone tells the kidney to reabsorb calcium. Also magnesium kind of follows calcium, but it causes the kidney to also dump out phosphate. The two things that are released from bone when we break down bony matrix with the osteoclast are mainly calcium and phosphate. Some other lesser minerals come out, but you get a whole bunch of calcium, you get a whole bunch of phosphate out from bony matrix. We want the calcium, we don't want the phosphate. If phosphates increase to high levels in the blood, that's toxic. So we want the kidney to reabsorb the calcium 
but we want the, also the kidney to dump out phosphates in the blood. I mean, in the urine from the blood. So we want to get rid of the phosphate and parathyroid hormone tell the kidney to do that. All right, now let's get into our next gland. Does anybody have any questions before I move forward to the next gland? All right, very good. If you ever do, uh, again, you can just email me, it's fine. All right, so the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands sit on top of our kidneys. So they look like this little triangular shaped pyramid looking thing sits on top of the kidney. And since it, they sit on top of the kidney, they're also called the suprarenal glands. Suprarenal means on above kidney. So the adrenal gland has two major components to it. Oh, it also is surrounded by a connective tissue capsule, collagen fibers. So it's an encapsulated gland. Just deep to the capsule, is an outer part of the gland called the cortex. That's called the adrenal cortex. In the middle of the gland, that's what we call the adrenal medulla. So on the lecture test, we don't have to identify the zones of the gland. You will have to identify that in lab though. And I was getting emails, where do I find the answers to the slides? And I'll just tell you this for lab, when you get to slides, you can Google the name and you're going to get a million pictures of the slides labeled, or you can use your book. Um, all of the pictures look fairly similar, even though they might be stained differently. If you know where the location is supposed to be, you shouldn't have a problem. So we're going to go through the, the uh, adrenal cortex first. So let me just tell you what we have here. This is the outer part of the gland up here. You see the little box that we're looking at. That would be the capsule up there. Just deep to the capsule is the first zone. It's fa a fairly small zone. It's called the zona glomerulosa. So the zona glomerulosa is the first zone of cells in the adrenal cortex. The middle zone is called the zona fasciculata. And this is the name that was misspelled on one of the assignments in lab. I subsequently went in there and fixed it, but I don't know if it's still marking it wrong. If it does, y'all just need to tell me. But I think I gave everybody credit for that, um, for the people in lab. Um, so the middle zone is called the zona fasciculata. And then the zone just before what we call the medulla is called the zona reticularis. Now, I will say that all hormones that come from the adrenal cortex are all steroid hormones. And there's over 50 different hormones that come from the adrenal cortex. We're going to cover the main groupings of them and give an example of them. So the zona glomerulosa produces a group of hormones called mineralocorticoids. I'm going to show you that on, on the slides as we get to them. The main mineralocorticoid, about 95% of all of those steroid hormones is, is called aldosterone. The middle zone, the fasciculata layer of cells, produce groups of hormones called glucocorticoids. And the main glucocorticoid is cortisol. In my notes, I put down the three main ones. I put cortisol, cortisone, and corticosterone. Those are the three main ones, but cortisol is the most concentrated. And then we have the zona reticularis. It produces... Uh, groups of hormones called androgens, and this is a this is a generic name that a generic name that means male hormone. Androgens are male hormones. Then we get down to the adrenal medulla. The medulla is the middle part of the gland. It contains groups of cells called chromaffin cells. Chromaffin cells respond to sympathetic stimulation, the sympathetic nervous system. And when the sympathetic nervous system fires during a fight or flight response, you learned about name P1, these cells are stimulated by acetylcholine to release epinephrine and norepinephrine into the blood. So for that reason, a fight or flight response that we learned about is controlled by both the nervous system, the sympathetic system, and the endocrine system because epinephrine and norepinephrine are being dumped out in the blood from the adrenal medulla. 
All right, so let's get into these zones and, and a couple of reflexes here. The first zone, just deep to the capsule, is called the zona glomerulosa. Those cells produce a group of hormones called mineralocorticoid. So if we look at this name, mineralocorticoid, the ending on this name, oid, means steroid. So there are a group of steroid hormones. The middle part of the name, cortico, means adrenal cortex, the cortex. And then the first part of the name, obviously, well, it just means mineral. So this is a generic name that means they are steroid hormones from the adrenal cortex that has something to do with the minerals in the body. That's what that is. So the main mineral of corticoid is aldosterone. Aldosterone targets the kidney and it is going to be involved in regulating the levels of sodium and potassium in the blood. It basically makes the kidney reabsorb more sodium and makes the kidney dump out more potassium in urine. So we put sodium in the blood and by doing that, we're gonna learn also later on Wherever sodium goes, water is sure to follow. So if someone is dehydrated and we need more water in our blood, aldosterone is gonna be one of the hormones involved in that reflex. It's gonna be stimulated to be released. I'm gonna tell you how in a second. It's gonna target the kidney. The kidney will reabsorb more sodium back into the blood and water will follow it. So basically the kidney reabsorbed more salt water, which elevates your blood volume and thus elevates your blood pressure. But at the same time, we want to get rid of our potassium. You don't want too much potassium in your blood because that can give you a heart attack pretty quickly, which I usually talk about in the heart chapter. But uh, just to give you a for instance, the lethal injection is a potassium salt. It's potassium chloride. And they put so much potassium chloride in the blood that it stops the heart. I'll tell you how high potassium stops the heart when we get to the heart chapter. But nonetheless, aldosterone is going to cause for a reabsorption of salt water, which helps increase volume in our blood and our blood pressure. It is part of the most important hormonal regulator of blood pressure in our body. We're going to learn this a couple of times a semester, the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. So that's what I'm going to show you part of it right now. So I know this particular loop looks kind of scary because there's a lot of stuff on it, but it's really not that bad. This is not the whole loop for everything that goes on, but this is part of what happens. All this stuff that I'm about to go over is part of what happens in people that are dehydrated or people that lost blood volume. So let's start at number one. What jump starts all of this loop to occur? Well, moderate to severe dehydration, you don't have water in your blood. Someone that has a sodium deficiency, because they have too much water in their blood. So ultimately, if we have a sodium deficiency, usually it's from the loss of fluid from our body, um, like diarrhea, vomiting, things like that, can cause a drop in sodium in the, in the blood. That can trigger this response. And then loss of blood directly, hemorrhaging. So someone that's losing blood out directly also will fall into jump-starting this category because all of these conditions right here causes a drop in blood volume. As our blood volume levels drop, it also drops our blood pressure. These two are linked. If our blood volume goes up, blood pressure goes up. If our blood volume goes down, our blood pressure goes down. So dehydration, hemorrhaging, and all of that causes a drop in volume, which causes a drop in pressure. Here's where the loop begins. There are some special cells in the kidney. They're called juxtaglomerular cells. They are also abbreviated J, G cells. We're gonna look at them again when we get to the kidney chapter, but for now, you just need to know that the juxtaglomerular cells are sensitive to low blood pressure. And they can sense when the blood pressure is too low, and if it is too low, 
they respond by releasing an enzyme called renin. So this is the first part of the reflex. In the name renin, angiotensin, aldosterone pathway. Renin is gonna jumpstart the pathway. So when renin is released, it binds to its substrate, which is called angiotensinogen. That is a protein in the, in the blood. It's a plasma protein produced by the liver. It's circulating in everybody's blood right now in an inactivated form. We always know if this molecule is inactivated, if we see OGEN on the end of it. OGEN means the protein's not activated yet. So if we wanna increase our blood pressure, we wanna activate this molecule. So what activates that molecule? Well, renin does. So renin, like a little pair of molecular scissors, cuts this protein into two pieces. A little piece that means nothing and the bigger piece that's called angiotensin one. So renin is an enzyme, cuts this protein in half and we get angiotensin one out. Angiotensin one now circulates away from the kidney and the rest of the, in the body and goes up to the lung level. When angiotensin one in blood flows through the pulmonary capillaries in the lungs, it then comes in contact with another enzyme. That enzyme is called angiotensin converting enzyme or ACE. ACE converts angiotensin one to angiotensin two. Now angiotensin two is the most activated of all of the angiotensins in our body. It has five principal effects in our body and all five effects in some form or fashion tries to increase your blood volume and your blood pressure. So for that reason, someone that has hypertension and you don't want their pressure to go up, doctors may put them on a drug that blocks this enzyme. The drugs that block angiotensin converting enzyme are called, yep, you guessed it, ACE inhibitors, right? So if someone's on an ACE inhibitor, you never get angiotensin II out and you block the increase in pressure in the ways that it tries to increase pressure in the body. So angiotensin II is now circulating in the blood. What does it do? Well, I put here a couple of events that it does. We're gonna go through the rest of them before the end of the semester. Um, I might have a couple at the end of the packet as well. So. But angiotensin II targets the adrenal cortex, specifically the zona glomerulosa cells. The zona glomerulosa cells have receptors for angiotensin II. So angiotensin II stimulates the zona glomerulosa cells to release aldosterone, and aldosterone then targets the kidney. So when aldosterone targets the kidney, it tells the kidney to reabsorb as much sodium as possible. And wherever sodium goes, water is going to follow it. So indirectly, aldosterone is telling the kidney to also reabsorb water. Now, it doesn't tell the kidney directly to reabsorb the water. The water is obliged to follow the sodium. So by reabsorbing more sodium, you reabsorb more water which helps increase blood volume, which then increases blood pressure. Aldosterone though also tells the kidney to dump out more potassium and acid into urine. So basically we're getting rid of potassium from our blood, we're getting rid of acid in the form of hydrogen ions from the blood, and we're dumping that out in urine. So aldosterone causes for sodium reabsorption, but for potassium and hydrogen secretion out in urine. Now, the zona glomerulosa cells can also be stimulated to release aldosterone if someone has too much potassium in the blood, which is very bad. If we have too much potassium in the blood, that can cause cardiac arrhythmias, which is an abnormal heartbeat, or even death. So for that reason, 
our kidneys are more attuned to secreting potassium and reabsorbing sodium instead of vice versa. So if there's too much potassium in the blood, which is called hyperkalemia, then the zona glomerulosa cells will release aldosterone, which obviously targets the kidney and tells the kidney to dump out potassium, All right? So that's the aldosterone part of the loop over here. And it's all triggered by angiotensin II or high potassium in the blood. But angiotensin II has a couple of other effects. Here's only the one other one so far. Angiotensin II is a vasoconstrictor. So it vasoconstricts small arteries in the body called arterioles, in which case that helps increase our blood pressure. Now I know we don't know the reason why yet, but it's, it's sufficient for now for you to know that if our blood vessels decrease their diameter, our pressures can go up. And if our blood vessels increase their diameter, our pressure goes down. All right, so we're gonna talk more about that when we get to chapter 21. But angiotensin II causes for aldosterone release, which causes for sodium and water reabsorption in the kidney, which raises blood volume and blood pressure. The zona glomerulosa cells are stimulated to release aldosterone if the potassium level is too high to get the kidneys to dump out potassium and acid in urine. It will also reabsorb more sodium and water to help increase volume and pressure. Angiotensin II vasoconstricts in the body, which then increases pressure. Um, let's see. Hold on one second. Guys, I need to stop sharing this for one second. I'm sorry, my dog is going crazy outside. Hold on one second. All right, so this is the most important hormonal regulator of blood pressure in our body. So uh, we have to learn it. And for that reason, we're gonna learn it about three times a semester, all right? So just review that, let me know if you have any questions on it, but we're gonna revisit it later as well, but in other chapters. All right, so let's get into the rest of the adrenal cortex so we can move forward. The uh, adrenal cortex, the middle zone is called the zona fasciculata. It produces glucocorticoids, which are steroid hormones from the adrenal cortex that have something to do with glucose. Now that's what it was originally called. We now know that the glucocorticoids manipulate the metabolism of um, pretty much all three of the major, or all three of the energy containing, calorie containing food items, which we're gonna cover. So the glucocorticoids include cortisol, cortisone, and corticosterone. Cortisol is our body's natural form of hydrocortisone. If you ever went and bought hydrocortisone, put on a rash or something and it decreases inflammation, you know, makes it stop itching and everything. Well, cortisol is our body's natural anti-inflammatory. So it, they, they do have uh, anti-inflammatory effects for that, for that reason. Uh, people that have, you know, uh, they're sick and their, their body's going through a major inflammatory response. The doctor will give you steroids, you know, like prednisone and stuff, which mimics the activity of the glucocorticoids. So the glucocorticoids are regulated on a negative feedback loop, which I'm going to show you on the next slide. But oops, let's just go through uh, what the glucocorticoids are going to be involved with. The glucocorticoids help mobilize all three of our energy sources. So we can use those energy sources to make ATP to withstand stress. The glucocorticoids are our body's natural stress hormones, and it helps us make it through a time of stress. So uh, glucocorticoids increases the breakdown of protein. So I need you to, I didn't write that out. Uh, let me write that out. The breakdown of large polymers or molecules in our body is referred to as catabolism, catabolic reactions, if you remember that. So, reaction, let me underline that. 
This is catabolic reactions. So we catabolize our protein. And why would, would we want to do that? Mainly from our muscles. That's where the majority of our protein's at. Well, the reason why glucocorticoids increases pro the breakdown of protein or protein catabolism is to release amino acids in the blood. The amino acids can be used as the energy source themselves. Um, and they can, some of them can be converted into glucose in the liver and in the kidney for that matter. So when the liver produces glucose from a non-sugar molecule like lactic acid and some amino acids, it's called gluconeogenesis. So the liver can make new sugar for us. This is genesis is the production of neo is new and gluco is glucose. So this is the production of a new sugar. That's what that word means. So we break down protein, release amino acids in the blood, mobilize them. The liver will increase the breakdown of glycogen, which I didn't put here. That's called glycogenolysis. Um, but it also can produce new sugar, gluconeogenesis. So the glucocorticoids increases our blood sugar. That's what that, all that means, increases our blood sugar. Um, they can also cause the breakdown of lipids in adipose tissue, which is called lipolysis. And in some cases, depending on how much we have, it can cause for some adipose tissue in the body to rebuild lipids. So we, we move the production of lipids around in the body. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. But we, we mobilize the release of lipids, basically fatty acids in the blood. So those fatty acids can be broken down and used in aerobic respiration, specifically in the mitochondria during the Krebs cycle, if you remember that from general biology. Um, they also re reduce our stress. They resist stress in the body. That's why they're released when we're under stress. And stress in our body can either be physical, trauma, you know, physical trauma stress, um, emotional, physiological stress. There's all sorts of different stressors that cause glucocorticoids to be released. And then obviously it's an anti-inflammatory. So it decreases inflammation in our body. So these are some of the major effects of the glucocorticoids. And here is the feedback loop for the control and release of glucocorticoids from the zona fasciculata. So how does this loop work? Well, this loop is based on how many glucocorticoids we have in the blood to begin with. So how many do we have in the blood? If we have enough, we don't need to make them. If we don't have enough of them, we have to make them. So this is where the loop gets jump started. So the controlled condition is the level of glucocorticoids in the blood. We have receptors in the hypothalamus. Those neurosecretory cells in the hypothalamus are sensitive to low levels of glucocorticoids. So in the, when the glucocorticoid levels are low, the hypothalamic cells say, hey, we need to release corticotropin releasing hormone, CRH. CRH circulates down to the anterior pituitary gland where it binds to its receptor, the corticotropes. CRH tells the corticotropes to produce ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone. ACTH circulates in the blood down to its target, which lo and behold, are the cells in the zona fasciculata. And so the fasciculata cells receive ACTH, which is a protein hormone, so they're gonna to bind to a cell surface receptor, and they're gonna release the glucocorticoids. So this loop is gonna run and run and run until the glucocorticoid levels are back up to a sufficient level, in which case, the neurosecretory cells in the hypothalamus say, hey, we have enough glucocorticoid. Let's stop releasing CRH. In the absence of CRH, the corticotrophs stop releasing ACTH. In the absence of ACTH, the fasciculata cells stop releasing the glucocorticoids. Negative feedback loop controls them. <clears throat> All right, the innermost zone of the adrenal cortex is the reticularis. The zona reticularis produces androgens, which are male hormones. In both males and females, male hormones come from the adrenal cortex, specifically the reticularis. The most prevalent of the male hormones that come from the reticularis is called dehydroepiandrosterone. A lot of students hate this name because it's very long, 
but it is spelled exactly how you pronounce it. Dehydroepiandrosterone. D-H-E-A. All right, produced by the reticularis. Now, in males, after puberty, DHEA is, is pretty much physiologically non-relevant because the major male hormone in the male from puberty on is testosterone. And even just before puberty, it's been on the rise. So, but however, as the male baby is growing in utero, DHEA is relevant because it is involved in the production of the male genitalia. But after puberty, there's so much testosterone in the male body that it overrides a little, little effect that DHE would have. Now, DHEA becomes more physiologically relevant, relevant in females, specifically postmenopausal females. So females that have gone through menopause already, as everybody knows, are not making estrogens and progesterone, their hormones anymore. So some women have to get put on estrogen repa replacement therapy to subside menopausal symptoms, but some don't. And so one of the differences between females like that, some that need the therapy and some that don't need hormone replacement therapy, is the level of DHEA that they make. As it turns out, androgens like testosterone and dehydroepiandrosterone become estradiol compounds in the body. Estrogen and testosterone are related steroid hormones, by the way. So basically the estrogens, the easy way to say it, uh, postmenopausally in women come from DHEA and the other androgens that are produced by the reticularis. So that's the source of the female hormone postmenopausally. It also is the hormone that drives female libido. Estrogen does not drive libido. Male hormones drive libido. So in the male, this doesn't drive libido because there's so much testosterone. But in the female, this is where the, ma the male hormone comes from. So that is driving libido in females. Now the adrenal medulla is stimulated by the autonomic nervous system, specifically the sympathetic system. Sympathetic preganglionic neurons from the autonomic nervous system release acetylcholine onto the chromaffin cells, and they then respond to acetylcholine by releasing epinephrine and norepinephrine. So let me write, let's see, the adrenal medulla is stimulated by this. Let me write it in there. All right, so the sympathetic neurons release acetylcholine, and you guys can write that in. Um, release acetylcholine when the sympathetic nervous system fires, and chromaffin cells respond to that acetylcholine. Oh, I misspelled it. Acetylcholine, and they respond to acetylcholine by releasing epinephrine and norepinephrine, which helps increase a fight or flight response in the body. <clears throat> All right, excuse me. All right, so I'll put the table from our book here. It has the zones of the adrenal cortex with their hormones, how the hormones are controlled, their secretion, and then what the principal actions are in one place. So make sure you just review that before you take the test and I think you'll be fine. All right, so let's talk about the pancreas. The pancreas lies just inferior and posterior, posterior and inferior to your stomach. So in this little graphic, your stomach would cover this up. And the left lateral portion of our stomach, the area called the fundus of the stomach, intrudes into the spleen over here, into this gastric flexure. But the stomach's been removed, so we can see the pancreas. The pancreas has a head, which is always near the first part of the small intestine called the duodenum. Then there's a body of the pancreas in the middle and the tail of the pancreas is always on the left side of the body that protrudes towards the spleen. That'll help you out more so for lab. 
I'm not going to make you identify the parts in here. So the pancreas is a special gland in our body because it's part of both um, the digestive system and the endocrine system. It's actually a gland that is composed of two different types of gland cells. There are exocrine gland cells, which I'm not interested in, but the exocrine gland cells are called acinous or acini cells. And that's all the cells that you see on the outside of this circle. <clears throat> so the acini cells are the majority of all the cells in the pancreas. They make up about 98% of all the cells in the pancreas. But there are clusters of four cell types that form these little circles. And here's a graphic of it over here. These little circular structures are called the islets of Langerhan or the pancreatic islet. The pancreatic islet is the endocrine portion of the pancreas, which contains four different cell types, which produce four different hormones. So we're going to cover the physiology briefly on two of them, the first two, alpha and beta cells, but I still want you to know the name of the cell and the hormone that they make, all right? So there's alpha cells, beta cells, delta, and F cells. Know the hormones that they make. We're going to go over alpha and beta cells, at least some of their functions. All right, so alpha cells and beta cells in part regulate glucose levels in our blood. Now insulin does a little bit more than that and glucagon does a little bit more than that. But here is the regulation of sugar. So the alpha cells and the beta cells respond to how much sugar is in the blood directly. So if we have a low blood sugar, which is called, as you probably know already, hypoglycemia, the, the alpha cells will release glucagon. In all of glucagon's effects, it tries to increase blood sugar levels, blood glucose levels. So how does glucagon increase our blood sugar levels? Well, first of all, during hypoglycemic events, glucagon would be released. Glucagon targets the liver and tells the liver to break down glycogen. That is called glycogenolysis. So let me write that in. So, well, look, it put it down here. Let me decrease this. There you go. Let me just decrease it. Should have wrote those in there. All right, so you can write that down because we need to know these terms. So how does glucagon help increase sugar? Well, it's going to target the liver. The liver has our sugar store in it, which is glycogen. That's a polysaccharide. So if we need glucose in the blood, we need to break down the polysaccharide that's made from glucose. So that's called glycogenolysis, the breakdown of glycogen. So that's going to put sugar in the blood. We also then can tell the liver to make glucose from a non-sugar. So some lactic acid molecules, lactate really, the, the ion form, lactate from uh, anaerobic respiration, you might remember that, and certain amino acids can be converted into sugar, glucose. That's called gluconeogenesis. So glucagon's telling the liver to put sugar in the blood, put sugar in the blood, which raises your blood sugar levels. And as your blood sugar levels come back to normal, they might even surpass normal. And you might have a little bit too much sugar in the blood, which is hyperglycemia. And hyperglycemia inhibits the alpha cells but hyperglycemia stimulates the beta cells to release insulin. So insulin is a hormone, as you already probably know, that lowers your blood sugar, but it does a lot more than just regulate blood sugar. But nonetheless, it does regulate blood sugars. How does it do that? Well, 
If we have too much sugar in the blood, we want to tell the cells around the body to take the sugar up from the blood. So the majority of the cells around the body take sugar up from the blood via facilitated diffusion. So the cells are taking it up. They also, insulin also tells the liver to take up extra sugar and put it back into the storeroom. So it builds glycogen. So that's called glycogenesis. Um, let me do this. Sorry. All right, increases glycogenesis by the liver and insulin. I have a question. Go ahead. On the test, will we have to know uh, whether glycogenesis is in the alpha, alpha or beta cells, like where it takes place? Okay, um, well, the alpha cells and the beta cells never leave. You might be referring to their hormones. Yeah, Okay, Sorry. so that's okay. Um, well, you don't, yeah, you're going to have to know that this ta target, this is in the, in the liver. If that's the question I need, I want you to know what the targets are. So maybe I should have put, put that down too. You could write it in because I'm running out of space here. Just write in glucagon increases glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis in the liver. So, you know, the liver is going to be involved with that. Insulin increases glycogenesis, which is the production of glycogen in the liver. So see, for that reason, glucagon and insulin are antagonistic. Glucagon increases sugar, but insulin decreases it. But how does that, how do we do that? Well, insulin tells the cells around the body to take up sugar. So they're going to use some of it. Well, the liver also will take up sugar, but what is the liver going to do with it? Well, the liver is going to rebuild the sugar store that we broke down with the use of glucagon. So all day long, these hormones are fighting one another to regulate your sugar levels in these ways. If we need sugar, break down glycogen in the liver. If we have too much sugar, rebuild glycogen in the liver. So for, for that reason, we are always building up the storeroom or always removing sugar from the storeroom is another way I can say it if that makes sense. All right, so that happens in the liver. So yeah, I, I need you to know that the liver is a target for those. But insulin also causes for an increase in lipogenesis. Lipogenesis occurs in adipose tissue because that's a buildup of lipids. Increased lipogenesis in adipose tissue, right? All right, so those are those terms. So I need you to know what really what the terms mean and what the targets are. So I'll put here in liver. All right, now insulin. So insulin regulates sugar, as we know already. Now we know that insulin can regulate lipid production but insulin also regulates protein production. So insulin also increases protein synthesis in tissues. And for that reason, insulin is an important hormone for cell, uh, for tissue growth, repair and reproduction in our body. So it's not only involved in sugar metabolism, it's involved in protein production, it's involved in uh, lipid production. For this reason, insulin also is called the fat building hormone. So if we're, if we're always increasing our intake of sugar, like you constantly drink Cokes and sodas, sugary sodas and eat candy and cakes, always overeating sugar, you constantly are releasing insulin from beta cells, which tells the adipocytes to take up the sugar from the blood and make a fat out of it. So we make a lot of our fat weight from excess carbohydrate intake because of insulin. 
All right, so those are those hormones and what they're doing. So insulin is going to drop our blood sugar. Ultimately, it may drop a little bit. If we become hypocalcemic again, it inhibits the release of insulin, but stimulates the release of glucagon. So these two hormones are antagonistic to one another, All right? All right, um, we're almost finished with this. Uh, as far as the ovaries and the testes go, just know what I put here. We're gonna cover these specifically in the reproductive system chapter at the end of the semester. So uh, know that the ovaries produce the estrogens. Um, there's actually a couple of main groups of them. They're called estradiol and estrone. Um, there's six major classes of estrogens. We're not gonna learn all of them, but those are two of the major classes. Progesterone, you probably heard of, and then we have relaxant and inhibit. The main hormone from the testes in the male body is testosterone. Um, so, which, you know, pretty much people already know. And these hormones from the ovaries help regulate all aspects of the female reproductive cycle. Testosterone and the estrogens, estrogens in females, testosterone in males, uh, aid in the changes that occur during puberty. The main differences between the male and female body plan occurs because of testosterone. There's more androgen in the male body than the female body, and that's why males get deeper voices. Their muscle masses uh, and bone densities are, are higher than a typical female of a relative body size. So all of those different hair distribution patterns, fat distribution patterns are all attributed uh, the differences because of testosterone. These hormones also are involved in the production of the gametes, sperm in the male and the eggs in the female which are called oocytes. The pineal gland produces a hormone that you've probably heard of called melatonin. Melatonin is a hormone that helps control our biological clock. Your biological clock is referred to as the circadian rhythms. Circadian rhythms occur in all forms of life, even in us. And basically all that is, is that the living organism in even a single cell goes through a period of activity and then a period of inactivity. So basically I could attribute that to like, we go to sleep and we wake up. So we're active when we're awake and obviously we're inactive when we're sleeping. So melatonin is a hormone that makes you sleepy. It's produced by the pineal gland, which is located at the roof of the third ventricle in your brain. So if you remember the brain anatomy from AMP1, great. If not, don't worry about it. We're not going to you know, uh, identify it in here. You do have to identify it in lab though. So it's a little bitty pea-sized gland that's just at the roof of the, above the third ventricle at what was called the corpora quadrigemina. If you remember the superior and inferior colliculi. Um, if y'all have a problem with that, I can show you a model of that in the lab. Just bring it up and I'll, I'll point it out. But nonetheless, the pineal gland produces melatonin when we don't see light or when it starts to get dark. So in darkness is when the gland is producing melatonin. And when we see light, the gland stops producing melatonin, which is kind of interesting because that means the gland is light sensitive. So when we open our eyes and we see light, we stop making melatonin. But when we're going to bed at night and it's getting dark, you start getting tired, then you shut your eyes, melatonin levels start to climb and it makes us tired. For that reason, some people take melatonin as a sleep aid. You know, some people say it works, some people doesn't. I don't know. I've never tried it, so I don't know. But nonetheless, it helps set our biological clock. Um, that's the main role that I want you to know. There's a lesser role of it. Uh, there's some research out there suggesting that melatonin um, may have an anti-cancer effect in our body, but there's very little research on that right now, so I usually don't mention that too much. Um, the thymus gland is located in the thoracic cavity, just uh, superior and anterior to your heart. The thymus gland is going to be covered in detail in uh, the lymphatics chapter because the thymus gland is involved in allowing for the production of our immunocompetent T cells. This, these are some of our immune system cells. So they're actually, they mature in the thymus gland. They do so because the thymus gland produces hormones like thymosin, thymic humeral factor, and thymopoietin. 
all of these hormones in some form or fashion are involved in allowing T cells to become activated. So we're gonna cover that activation process more specifically in chapter 22. For now, I just need you to know the hormone names that the thymus gland makes and that they help stimulate the maturation of our T cells. Our t and that's short for T lymphocytes. If you guys already know the names of those. All right, so there's a link in here for hormone functions, a, a generic one. I'm assuming some of y'all are looking at that already. The last thing that I wanna cover in this chapter um, are a couple of disorders here. Uh, the pituitary dwarfism and gigantism or giantism is a problem with human growth hormone. So there's an abnormal secretion of gr human growth hormone from the somatotrophs. So pituitary dwarfism occurs because we don't have enough growth hormone. And if someone has pituitary dwarfism and it's caught early in childhood, then they can get put on human growth hormone replacement therapy and they would start to grow normally again. However, if it's caught late, then they still would be short in stature, right? Um, there are some people that produce too much human growth hormone and they become giants. Um, I think the, the tallest person on record is over eight feet tall. You can look it up, but um, there was a few people that had giantism that was even in the movies and stuff. But I'm not going to ask you all of that. But ultimately, those individuals having too much growth hormone as a child grow real big. Now, if you're already finished growing and you start to produce too much growth hormone because you might have a uh, pituitary tumor or something, you will not grow any bigger because your bones are all, the uh, epiphyseal plates are all sealed up. So you're not gonna get any bigger, but some things do happen and like bodybuilders that abuse human growth hormone and inject it, they start to have side effects, some pretty serious ones. Um, it can cause uh, heart failure, liver failure. It can cause increased intracranial pressure because it thickens the bones around the skull. It thickens your skin, becomes more tough and leathery and it starts to increase the diameter of the bones in the hands and the feet. So the fingers and the toes get really thick and big, and that's called acromegaly, big hands and big feet. Um, the people that abuse human growth hormone can ultimately have their, their brow, the bones on the frontal bone, starts to protrude out a little bit. And that's called the Neanderthal effect from that particular hormone abuse. Um, but as a grown person, you don't grow tall anymore, but there are some things that will continue to grow and get big like your hands and feet, which is called acromegaly. Um, a goiter is an increased, uh, thyroid gland, uh, increased size of the thyroid gland. It's caused by a decreased production of the thyroid hormone because of an iodine deficiency. So, let me go back up here real quick and explain a goiter. Look at this picture. One of the main effects of thyroid stimulating hormone is to cause the cell to incorporate these transporters to get iodine from the blood. So the, this is called iodide trapping. So if someone doesn't have iodine in their diet, they won't be transporting the iodide ion in the blood and without iodide, you can't complete the process. So the protein gets stuck out here in the, in the lumen of the follicle. And without the thyroid hormones being produced, the cell gets bombarded by thyroid stimulating hormone to keep making this protein. Well, they can't finalize the step to make T3 and T4 because there's no iodide. So what does the cell always do? Produce protein, produce protein, and produce protein so that each one of these follicles gets huge. They get filled up with that protein solution in there called the colloid. So that colloid gets more and more and more voluminous inside the follicle and it makes the thyroid gland get really big in the neck. And that's what we call a goiter. So a simple goiter is caused by an iodine deficiency. 
all right? And it causes, that basically would, would cause a hypothyroidism. Hyperthyroidism induced by an autoimmune response to the thyroid gland is called Graves' disease. Graves' disease is where a person's immune system produces antibodies that mimic thyroid stimulating hormone. So when they have a flare or an immune system attack and they produce those antibodies, those antibodies stimulate the thyroid gland to produce too much T3 and T4 and they get hyperthyroidism. That's called Graves' disease. It's auto, an autoimmune disorder. Now, during a Graves' disease, those people with hyperthyroidism have several different symptoms. Let's just think about what thy thyroid hormones do. Thyroid hormones affect the heart. Remember, it's, it has a synergistic effect with epinephrine and norepinephrine on the heart. So if you have too much thyroid hormone, the heart becomes very, very sensitive to the epinephrine, so your heart rate can go up. So a person's resting heart rate's higher than normal. That's called tachycardia, higher than normal heart rate. A person's body temperature can go up by a degree. Basically, they can be warmer than normal. Because remember, thyroid hormones help maintain body temperature. Uh, a person can have excess energy. Remember, thyroid hormones help manipulate energy, ATP production. So they can have all this nervous energy. They can have a hyperexcitability from the nervous system. So they're, they're all jittery. Um, since they utilize their energy sources so much more efficiently, they have trouble gaining weight. So hyperthyroidics typically are, you know, on the more of the skinny side. They don't, I'm, I'm not going to say they're real skinny, but because some of them aren't real, real skinny, but they have trouble losing weight. I mean, gaining weight. So all of those types of symptoms are in people that have hyperthyroidism. Um, I put down here one of the disorders from the adrenal cortex. It's called Cushing syndrome. I don't know why I didn't put the other one, Addison's disease. Um, Cushing syndrome is caused by the zona fasciculata producing too much glucocorticoid. So basically, and it could be caused from a tumor or some other abnormality of the reflex loop that's causing the fasciculata cells to release glucocorticoids. So if someone has too many glucocorticoids, they develop what's called Cushing syndrome. Now, people with Cushing syndrome typically have lanky, long arms, a barrel-shaped trunk, abdomen and th thoracic area, kind of a barrel shape. So their arms are thin, their trunk is kind of rounded and thicker. Their face typically is more rounded and red, and they might have a bump on the back of their neck at their back, kind of have a, a larger fat pad there. That's because the glucocorticoids manipulate fat metabolism, and it rearranges where in our body the fats are being produced. So, Glucocorticoids mobilize fats, but it also can cause the core of the body to retain some. That's why we, those individuals get this barrel-shaped body, kind of a rounded face. Their face is kind of flushed and red because the glucocorticoids increase blood pressure. I think I forgot to tell you all that one. Glucocorticoids are vasoconstrictors, so it helps increase pressure. Um, so they kind of get this red rash look on their face. The reason why their arms and legs are thin is because glucocorticoids cause protein catabolism. Remember, it causes the proteins to break down. So if you have too much glucocorticoid in the body for a prolonged period of time, you're basically wasting your own muscles away. You're burning the protein out of your muscle. So that's Cushing syndrome. There's another adrenal cortex uh, uh, abnormality that I normally have in here. I must have taken it out. It's called Addison's disease. Addison, Addison's disease is the exact opposite to Cushing syndrome. I might have it in my, in my type note packet. Um, that's where you don't have enough of the glucocorticoids, Addison's disease. So in Addison's disease, oh, I'm sorry. In Addison's disease, 
is when you have too much aldosterone. It, it's not affecting the glucocorticoids. I mixed it up. So in Addison's disease, those individuals have too much aldosterone produced, typically from a tumor in the adrenal cortex affecting the zona glomerulosa and near the fasciculata for that matter. Those two areas are kind of linked. And those individuals with Addison's disease typically um, have a, a darker skin color than normal. Like they look like they have a tan all the time because during the Addison's disease, there is an, an, an inhibition back to the brain, the hypothalamus and the pituitary that causes the corticotrophs to release adrenocorticotropic hormone. But a se secondary hormone that's released from them is melanocyte stimulating hormone. So during Addison's disease, those individuals have more melanocyte stimulating hormone released and it darkens their skin. But that's not the real problem. The real problem comes in, in the form of the cardiovascular system. Those individuals that are reabsorbing too much sodium ultimately have higher blood pressures, um, their arteries are damaged, and they typically die from cardiac failure. Uh, people with Addison's, and, and my aunt had it a long time ago. That's what she died from, Addison. She had diabetes and she had Addison's disease. So. Um, ultimately, and I think I have that in the type note packet. You can look it up, but since I don't have it in here, I might just take a, if I have a question on it, I'll take it out of the test. All right. The last few slides talks about, um, hormones that come from, uh, uh, other organs in the body that are not considered to be endocrine glands. So here I start with the kidneys. The kidneys produce three molecules that are important. Two of them are hormones. One of them is an enzyme. Calcitriol, we talked about already. Calcitriol is the active form of vitamin D. It's produced from the kidneys in the presence of PTH. And it causes for you to absorb calcium from your GI tract. So we talked about that one. We talked about renin. Renin is the enzyme that jump starts the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So that's gonna be important. That means the kidneys are sensitive to pressures. If the blood pressure is low, the JG cells release renin, which ultimately activates angiotensinogen so that we can increase our blood pressure. EPO, we haven't talked about yet. We won't see this until we get to chapter 19. That won't be until after we finish chapter 21 because I rearranged the order of the chapters to coincide with the lab. But I'll just mention it now. I might have a question on it. Um, EPO, erythropoietin, is produced by the kidney in times when oxygen levels in the blood are low. So when oxygen levels are low in the blood, the kidneys release EPO. EPO goes to your red bone marrow and targets a specific cell in there that I'm going to tell you about in chapter 19, but basically causes the stem cell in the red bone marrow to make red blood cells. So if you don't have enough oxygen in your blood, there's a negative feedback loop involving EPO to try and get your body to make more red blood cells because what's the main role of a red blood cell? Everybody kind of knows that already, right? It transports oxygen. So if you don't have enough oxygen, number one, you need to try and get more oxygen in. That's a given. So you're probably going to breathe faster. But another thing that a body is going to do is try and increase the number of workers to transport the oxygen. And that's the red blood cell. So that's a negative feedback loop based on how much oxygen is in the blood. And the kidney is sensitive to that. So if we have low oxygen, kidneys release EPO, and we make more red blood cells. That's the bottom line of the loop. All right. So angiotensin production. I'm not going to go back over this uh right now back over how we get angiotensin 2 out so i just wrote it out in words make sure you review that i want you to know the breakdown process here how we get angiotensin 2 out i put here four of the five effects of angiotensin 2 we're going to learn the fifth effect in the kidney chapter um the renal chapter so what does angiotensin 2 do, do well in all of its effects whether it's direct or indirect it tries to increase our blood volume and pressure. 
That's what angiotensin II is gonna try and do. So angiotensin II stimulates the release of aldosterone from the zona glomerulosa. And remember, aldosterone tells the kidney to reabsorb salt water, which increases blood volume and thus will increase blood pressure. So even though angiotensin II is not doing it directly there, it's doing it indirectly. Angiotensin II also is one of the stimulators for the release of ADH, antidiuretic hormone. Antidiuretic hormone, if you remember, targets the kidney and tells the kidney to reabsorb water, puts it in the blood, which increases blood volume and increases blood pressure. Angiotensin II is the molecule that makes you thirsty. So if you're ever outside in a hot summer day working in the garden or doing whatever you're doing and, and you just feel like you want to just drink a whole bunch of water, you're in stage one of hypovolemic shock. There's three stages to it. You're in stage one, which is moderate dehydration. Everybody experiences it before. So angiotensin II is part of that reflex. Um, that is going to help increase our blood volume and pressure when we're dehydrated, along with aldosterone and ADH for that matter. So angiotensin II pounds on the thirst center in your hypothalamus. Basically tells your thirst center, which is located in the hypothalamus, hey, I'm thirsty, let's drink some water. You don't want to coke, you don't want juice, you, you know, you don't want anything like that. You just want to drink some water. That means you're dehydrated. All right, and then angiotensin II is a vasoconstrictor, as I said before, and when we vasoconstrict, we increase our blood pressure. So in all of those ways so far, angiotensin II elevates volume and pressure in your blood. All right, now let's talk about the heart. The heart also produces a hormone. You know the heart pumps your blood through the body, and it's not a gland, but it does produce a signal molecule. The signal molecule is called atrial natriuretic peptide, ANP. ANP tries to decrease volume and pressure. So for that reason, ANP is an antagonist to angiotensin II, epinephrine and norepinephrine, aldosterone, and ADH. <coughs> Excuse me. Aldosterone, ADH, angiotensin II, and even the catecholamines, epinephrine and norepinephrine, try to help maintain our blood pressure in our body. Maintain our pressure and even elevate it. So all of these try to maintain and elevate pressure. Well, A and P tries to decrease your blood pressure because the stimulating factor that causes the cells in the posterior wall of the right atrium of the heart to produce atrial natriuretic peptide is an elevated blood volume. If you have too much volume, too much blood volume, that means your blood pressure is going to be high. And if we have too much blood volume, when that elevated blood volume makes its way back to the right atrium, it stretches it like an overfilled water balloon, which causes it to release A and P. So really, this is, a, is a, a stretch receptor reflex. For instance, you know when you're full, when you stop eating, your stomach is stretched. You put a lot of food in it. You're not hungry anymore. Same thing when you have to go to the bathroom to, to urinate. You know when you have to go to the bathroom because your bladder feels full. It's being stretched. Well, this is another stretch receptor reflex. So if the atria is over, overly stretched because there's too much blood in it, it releases AMP, which then basically targets the kidney and tells the kidney to dump water out in urine. So we're going to go over that reflex more specifically later on. But all you need to know for now is that AMP tries to decrease blood volume and blood pressure. I guess I should write that in there, huh? Increases urinary 
output volume, which decreases blood volume, by the way. So your urinary output and your blood volume is, are linked, if I never told you all that. So if, you, or if you're trying to bring your, volume, your blood volume down and bring your blood pressure down, you want the kidneys to dump water out in urine. If on the other hand, you want to maintain blood volume and blood pressure, you don't want your kidneys dumping urine out. So in that case, your urinary output volume would go down, but your blood volume would go up. So see how they're linked? So that's what this is. So uh, tells kidneys to lose water in urine, which increases urinary output volume and decreases blood volume. There you go. All right, so. Oh, look, I already wrote that down here. I didn't even read what I wrote. Leslie, is that why you were looking at me all kind of funny? <laughs> I didn't read what I wrote. All right, so I just wrote it twice. All right, so A and P tells the kidney to dump water, which decreases blood volume and decreases blood pressure, um, which is the exact opposite to all of these hormones down at the bottom in some form or fashion. So all of these down at the bottom, aldosterone, ADH, angiotensin two, and on, those are trying to increase blood volume and pressure, all right? All right, so I think that's it for this chapter, by the way. And since I went over 11, I think I'm not gonna start chapter 20 today. We'll do that Thursday. I don't know if your brains are tired at this point, which I'm sure they are. Um, so Thursday, so instead of just jumping into another unit of material, uh, I think we'll do that Thursday. And if I have to go a little bit over on Thursday, at least we're talking about the same topic. All right, so you can spend the rest of today reviewing all of the notes that we've covered in the endocrine system. And I would say into well into tonight or into to tomorrow try and start reading into chapter 20 if you haven't done that as of yet um i'm going to try and focus on the physiology material in chapter 20 so make sure you read through the powerpoint i'm gonna have to skip over some of the slides that i think are the easier slides um but i'm gonna definitely stop on the ones that are that contain the physiology stuff that is more difficult for you to learn all right so what we're gonna do is on Thursday, I'm gonna start chapter 20, I doubt I can finish it. However, our test, when's our test supposed to be on the 15th, is that right? Yeah, Monday, it's supposed to be yeah, Monday. Monday. Oh, it, it, but Monday's the 14th, right? No, yeah. it's the 15th, I think it's the 15th, Monday's the 15th. Let me see, let me put my calendar up real quick. Let me get my calendar. Yeah, Monday is the 15th, shoot. Yeah, it is. And I think that's the same thing in lab is too. Lab, lab uh, practical is the same exact day. Yeah. All right. So um, I think I'll extend our unit test into Tuesday then. Um, that's going to push us back a little bit, though, the way I worked out our calendar. Um, well, I'll, I'll have to just wind up finishing chapter 20 on Tuesday morning and just leave the test open until midnight on Tuesday night. Was that the 16th? All right. So we'll have through Tuesday night to do that. Um, I think the reason why I had it on the 15th, I think the 15th is the census day, but I don't need to use the unit test for the census day. Um, so we'll finish it. We'll, we'll start 20 on Thursday. I'm going to probably have to have a longer class just to, on that chapter. And the reason for that is because I know some people still have jobs and stuff. And I, I usually like to give you all a few days, you know, to try and take your, you know, to do the test when you are able to do it. But it, if I can't finish until Tuesday morning, then that's only going to leave you, you know, the rest of that day to review and then start to test that night to get it done all right so i think that we're gonna have to do it that way all right so does anybody have any questions about the next few days and what we're doing with that um what is the next chapter chapter 21 it's the heart yeah the, yeah the next chapter that we're going to cover after our unit one test 
is going to be 21. So the, the order they go in is chapter 21, then 19, then 24. I basically changed the order of the chapters in lecture to coincide with the systems that the order of the systems we cover in lab. I did that because about a year ago, I had some students that really complained because the lecture veered off a lot from the lab. That's why I did that. Okay. All right, so let me stop sharing this screen, I guess. All right, so does anybody have any questions? Did anybody show up in here that I didn't, that I didn't mark you here, by the way? Yes, Dana Bailey. Uh, Bailey? Yes, sir. Okay, I got you. What about Dempsey Marks? Kaiser? Lestrix here. She told me that already. I marked you here. Uh, I, I guess you can't tell me how to say your name. Chayla? Lestrix. What about Palma? Rutherford? Sanders? And Tanchez. All right. Well, that's it for this meeting, guys. Hey, I'm sorry. I, I forgot to put our Zoom meeting up. And thank you for the few people that emailed me. Um, I went in there to look out at it and to click on it. And it wasn't there because I forgot to do it. So I have a quick question, Professor, before we um, leave. Okay, go ahead. Um, what would you say in terms of studying, just like, review the powerpoints in our notes yes ma'am that the the test court the unit test questions do not come from wiley plus the test the unit test questions i write all myself and it comes from what i what i talk about on the powerpoint so you might want to review the the video once the link comes up a couple times and then um the powerpoint and the type note packet the outlines that i post in canvas Okay. Those are the Bibles to make an A on the unit test, by the way. All of those note packets in the PowerPoint. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Um, uh, also, welcome. I have an another question. On um, you said that you were gonna uh, fix the engage stuff. It still uh, sh it still won't show me the right answers for some uh, reason. I forgot to do that. It's Sorry. okay. I was just I'm, making I'm, sure. I'm gonna do it immediately after getting uh, off of this meeting. By the way. Thank you. All right. Anybody else have any questions? All right. Well, y'all have a good day. And for some people, I'll see you in lab tomorrow. All right. Thanks. Have a great day as well. All right. All right. You too. Bye.